Um, finally today, uh, I'd like to welcome Neve McCarthy, who's the National Coordinator of the Emergency Vacant Housing Delivery Ukraine Unit in the Local Government Management Agency, to present to us on the Local Authority response to the Ukraine hum humanitarian crisis. So as we know, since the 24th of February 2022, over 8 million Ukrainians have been displaced, with over 50,000 presenting in Ireland. I think I saw a figure of 58,000 this morning, actually. So while we saw over the, the weekend, I think, just how challenging this is for our country, local authorities, with many staff involved right across the sector, have provided significant support to national government in responding to the accommodation and other needs of those arriving from Ukraine and have been key to the provision of emergency centres, stepping up the community response forums and ensuring that the vulnerable people arriving are welcomed into our communities. So huge work has been done. Due to the scale of the crisis, local authorities have adopted innovative approaches to the delivery of services and supports. So this presentation will focus on highlighting a range of those best practices right across the sector. So welcome, Thank Geneve. Okay. Thanks, John. <clears throat> Um, hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here today and I'm with Aidan Bly who's the Director of Service for, Mun for Municipal Services in Dunleary Rattown and he's going to take over in a couple of minutes to talk about the innovative approach that Dunleary took to setting up the Ballyogan Rest Centre which I think is inspirational and I think you'll really enjoy it. Unfortunately it would be great to talk about the 31 local authorities and the range of best practice innovation that they've used around the response to this crisis. But I'm just going to give you a whistle tour stop of what they have done to the single biggest humanitarian crisis we've had. To put that into context, we've had 12 million Ukrainians have left the country. They have fled their country. 50, I had 56,000 were in the country, but Fiona has just said it's 58,000 now as of this morning. 43,200 of these are seeking accommodation um, from the state, of which 36,200 are in commercial and serviced accommodation. 1,000 are in rest centres and 5,000 are in pledge properties. With the current trends, it's expected that we'll have a serious deficit around beds in by the end of quarter one, 2023. So I suppose the challenge is huge for local authorities. And while local authorities, government are driving the overall policy, local authorities are at the front and centre of the crisis. And they are responding with huge innovation to adapt to this problem. Um, Local authorities, what we have done, what local authorities have done is they've set up emergency rest centres. 36 rest centres have been set up across the country since March 2022, um, with over 2,148 beds provided at the time. There are currently, um, sorry, my apologies, go back. Um, the community forum has been mobilised in each local authority. Local authorities have identified 475 vacant units to progress to provide a refurb programme with the Department of Housing and the Department of Children. And local authorities have worked with the Irish Red Cross pledge process. So they have assessed the 10,500 vacant and shared pledges that have been sent to them. And they have worked either within their own local authorities to move beneficiaries into pledge properties, or they've worked with the 19, in 19 local authorities, um, they've worked with implementing partners to support the implementing partners in the moving of uh, beneficiaries into um, pledged accommodation. And as of yesterday, the local authorities are going to be running a new pledge call, or a new vacant house call, and we're going to be progressing with that. I suppose to look at best practice, there's probably three phases that I'm going to focus on. The first one is the react phase. So this is around the setting up of those rest centers. And this has been streamlined and we have progressed an awful lot since then. So this is two examples of rest centers that were set up originally. You'll see that there was a lot of, so what, what was given out to staff was, there was advice sheets were developed for staff in facilities receiving and how to prepare to receive their guests. There was the mapping of all the services that are provided at local levels. The assessment process, you can see the assessment process in the photograph there, evolved over the seven, mon the seven months to I fully identify the needs in terms of health, education, language, jobs, qualifications, etc. And then, 
that we had communication tools, apps were used to provide for challenges around language barriers, etc. Uh, all the local authorities developed welcome packs for the Ukrainians coming into the local area, normally with the local development company. I am conscious that I'm kind of giving an overview. I maybe try, will try and dial it down a little bit. These were tailored, these packs then were tailored for individual rest centers. They had printed informational material. They provided multilingual format and they had the provision of sanitary packs sanit at the provision of supermarket vouchers. The likes of Kerry developed a step-by-step -step guide for the Ukrainians with all the agencies who inputted into that and provided information on the right to work, social welfare, health, education, trial, child care, driving licenses, banking, travel, passports and other available services within the local authority. Cork City developed a bags of welcome initiative. So what they used was a dormant account program which was targeted at children in direct provision, rest centres and sheltered accommodation. So they provided yellow and blue bags to these people um, with wordless books in it to encourage reading and to try and encourage the needs of the Ukrainians. Information leaflets were translated across all the local authorities into Ukrainians and there was hosting webinars provided for communities who were going to do hosting and to try and encourage people to host around the pledge process. Most local authorities have web portals that have up-to-date information and they have dedicated emails. So as you can... So as you can see, this is the likes of the, um, the information that was provided. So that's around fire safety. And you can just say the web portal that was available there. Around the support phase, as I said, the community forums were established. And I suppose the demand-led nature of the forum in relation to the refugees arriving into Ireland, into the different areas of the country, meant that the model had to be constantly evolving and required regular reviews to ensure that the needs of all the Ukrainians were met. And what I mean by that is that the most recent arrivals were much, needed much more supports than the arrivals who had come in March and April. Libraries played a key role. They provided free online language classes, conversational English classes, Ukrainian storytelling, arts workshops, free Wi-Fi, scanning and printing, books in Ukraine. Local authorities, transport. Local authorities work, worked with Local Link to set up new routes to support centres. But in tangent with that, Fingal brought in bleeper bikes to the accommodation centres to provide free bike service. And Limerick put, set up a bicycle hub where they worked with the Active Travel, they got funding from the Active Travel, they provided the facilities to take in bicycles, repair the bicycles and provide them for uh, the beneficiaries so that they had actually access to transport. On Garda Khan, the first bicycles that were provided were 19 bicycles that were recovered from On Garda Khan. So I suppose there was huge involvement around transport and then the whole area of agency signposting at that local level was critical. So many local authorities recruited integration developments, development officers, and that was to ensure that all stakeholders had provided for better integration. Then the community phase. I think to it's, it's, it's difficult to actually explain the scale of the engagement and the best practice and innovation that was embraced around the whole area of the community phase. There was national play dates, we had summer camps, there was classes, there was Ukrainian front days for families, there was the festival in the van initiative where a van came out to the local authority and provided a festival type scenario. Mano Egora, um, the women laughing, um, adjusted their activities to become the focal point or the hub, the pop-up shop, the skills, the sharing meeting, all were provided by local authorities. Yoga classes, Zumba classes were all embraced and provided by the local authorities. This is the Manoa Gora, their pop-up shop. That's the first baby who was born in Ireland. And this is the festival night that was carried out recently. Uh, look, at, I suppose I was only going to provide a quick whistle-stop tour. I'm going to pass you over now to Aidan Bly, who's going to talk about the setup and establishment of the Belly Ogan Rest Centre. Thanks very much.
thanks very much, Neve, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here today. Um, uh, I'm going to, I suppose, through a series of uh, photos, uh, talk you through uh, the Ballyog and Temporary uh, Re Regional Rest Centre. And I, I suppose why we call it a regional rest centre uh, for major emergency purposes, we sit in the East Region with our colleagues from uh, the other uh, councils in, in Dublin, as well as Wicklow and Kildare. And I suppose when the Ukrainian uh, crisis, when the refugee crisis uh, began, uh, the region had uh, anywhere from six to seven or eight uh, rest centres open at a time. And it was usually uh, difficult to manage all of that. Uh, and the civil defence and all of the various other volunteers were very, very stretched. So it was decided that we would set up uh, a centre, uh, a large centre, uh, consolidate resources as such on a regional basis. Um, so. I suppose with my team, uh, I, I looked at uh, several, uh, I suppose from the start, we, need, we, we, need, we needed uh, obviously the chief executive and the councillors on board as well. And uh, I think from, from, from day one, really, we wanted to show leadership in, in that regard and do something, uh, do as much as we, we could in terms of uh, helping people. So um, we looked at a number of options and uh, Ballyogan was the one that stuck out to me. I suppose the, the, the minute I walked up onto the site, I, I, I thought we could do something with this. Uh, in terms of the advantages of the site, uh, it was a site that DLR owned. Sorry, I'll flick on to... Yeah, so that, that's a, a dro drone uh, shot of the site itself. Um, large site, it's a site that DLR owned. It was a former uh, refuge bailing centre. Uh, hadn't been used in quite a number of years. Uh, so it was a site we owned, the site was empty. It was close to amenities, which was key. Lewis across the road, we had a leisure centre down the road, done stores, shops, all of that type of stuff was in walking distance. And uh, as I said, Lewis, so people could get in and out of town as well. Uh, one of the big, uh, I suppose, disadvantages, uh, it's, it, the site itself is quite rough and ready as such. Uh, it was very industrial. Uh, we were worried about bad PR at the time um, because of its former use, but uh, uh, to be fair, I think we felt uh, the minute we saw it that we could actually work with the site and do a lot with it to make it, uh, m m make it a, a comfortable place for, for, for people. Um, that gives you a sense. Uh, the, the, the building itself is split into two large uh, warehouse uh, rooms as such. That, that just gives you a sense of one of them there. So it's a huge facility, uh, very, very high ceilings. It would have been very, very difficult to heat, uh, very industrial looking, which is why we came up with a, a slightly different solution. Um, so in terms of the plan, um, there, I suppose uh, w once, once I pulled the team together uh, to deliver this, they just give a sense of uh, a lot of the key tasks that we had to go through, our, our, our planning boards as such. Uh, I, I suppose I put, a plan, I, I put a team together to deliver this and um, we based ourselves up on site in Ballyogan and we based ourselves there until it was delivered. Uh, so I, I suppose the plan was to deliver a temporary rest centre that would accommodate up to 300 uh, Ukrainian refugees for short periods uh, of one to three days. Um, the idea in terms of the existing building and its surrounds, you saw the building, it's quite industrial, was to transform it into a safe, comfortable and appropriately designed refugee accommodation centre. Uh, we were going to do it uh, through the erection of marquees within the structure of the building. Uh, by doing so, we would make it easier to manage, easier to heat, which was key. Um, and uh, also, I suppose the marquees are very flexible. Rather than having one giant uh, or two giant rooms, if you're breaking it down into a number of marquees, it's a, it's a lot easier to manage. Uh, and the, all of the marquees were connected through interconnected uh, walkways, covered walkways, to uh, services outside, so ki kitchen, for canteen facilities, the reception area, recreation rooms, they were all outside the building in marquees, but they were all connected by covered, covered walkways. Um, sorry, yeah. That just gives, uh, I suppose, that, that was the early site plan that we uh, worked to, so you can see within the uh, confines of the building there, you have, we have three, or six, well, five, three on one side, two on the other side, uh, five large marquees, each, each of those marquees uh, which sit within the building can, t can sleep uh, in approximately around 60 people each. And then we have, uh, I don't know how the pointer works, is it? Sorry. Uh, well, I 
just to the, on the top there, the yellow image, you can see there's canteen facilities. We have a reception area there. We have recreation rooms on the bottom uh, as well, toilet facilities, showers, and uh, uh, rec recreation rooms for kids, for teenagers, etc. So, uh, and as I said, they're, they're all connected through uh, covered walkways. So it felt like a, a, a canopied village as such. Uh, w w once you're inside the, the actual uh, marquees and the canopies, you don't sort of see that industrial uh, uh, structure as such. So uh, it was uh, qu quite, a, quite a good solution. Um, that gives you an idea in terms of the construction. So uh, the timescale was a very, very, as I said, we were in a situation where there was numerous uh, rest centres open across the uh, region at the time, uh, and uh, resources were really, really stretched in terms of volunteers. So um, we set ourselves a very ambitious time t t timetable, and uh, w w initially that was uh, we wanted to have this open in three weeks, uh, to have 180 beds open in three weeks, and to have uh, full capacity within five weeks. Uh, there was going to be sort of two phases to it. I broke it down into two phases, obviously construction and ongoing management. Uh, so I had a number of engineers from my water and drainage team work on the construction side of the house. And then the uh, sports development officer actually, uh, who's a lot of experience in events and things like that, I, I pulled him into the team to um, look after the sort of ongoing management piece and the wraparound services piece as well. And we, I suppose what makes you lo local authorities, I suppose, so unique is we've such a diversity of staff and such a range of services, as was described uh, by many people earlier, that we were able to pull on lots of experience through our community teams, libraries teams, arts teams, engineering skills, all, all of the various uh, skills get, skill sets that exist in the council. So uh, we, we, I suppose we had a core team, but we were able to pull on a lot of other experience. Uh, that gives you a sense, actually, on the lower part of the building, there was a big uh, concrete plinth there, and the guys had to, uh, they spent two weeks every day for 12 hours jackhammering that big uh, plinth out, so we get the marquees in. And the, the, the picture to the right there is one of the fire escapes, and again, we were dealing with, uh, the walls were uh, between two and three foot thick, so it was a huge, uh, huge undertaking to uh, hammer through so we could get the uh, fire escapes in. Um, Obviously, in terms of construction, we, we needed an emergency executive order to allow us to do this, uh, particularly in terms of, uh, I, I, I suppose, being able to start the construction, but also in terms of procurement as well. We needed to get the contractors on site immediately with, with such an ambitious timetable time to get this done. Uh, we, we had to get multiple contractors on site at once. Um, it had to be screened for AA and EAIR, and uh, we obviously we had to go through all the... the uh, the building uh, control regs as well, so we, which was challenging. Uh, but uh, as I said, we, we, we pulled on lots of experience and skills across the council to get it done. Uh, that gives you a sense, that's the first marquee going up in the large uh, hall that you would have seen earlier. So uh, it, it shows that actually gives a real scale to how, how big the actual building is. So in, in that particular hall, we, f we were able to fit three marquees of that size. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, up to 60 people in each marquee. And then in the uh, lower section of the building, um, I'm not an engineer myself, but uh, I have to say hats off to our engineers. They did an incredible job to maximize space there. What a perfect uh, fit inside that building. Uh, that particular marquee, uh, it's actually split on two, in two within, and again, it holds 60 people in each. So there's 120 people in that uh, mar marquee. Uh, and that, I suppose, shows the site uh, built, again, a, a, a drone shot of the site, uh, which you can see um, re replicates, I suppose, the plan that we, sh we showed there earlier, where you can see, uh, you can't see the sleeping accommodation, obviously it's inside the building, uh, but you can see some of the uh, connected marquees outside the building. Uh, the site uh, is run, obviously, on a 24-hour basis. Um, we have two managers. Uh, the, the setup we decided was we wanted a manager to uh, run the facilities side of the things, make sure the facilities run well, obviously with that many people uh, in the building and particularly with short stays, you have a lot of people coming and going and uh, the facilities get very, very heavily used from showers, toilets, etc. But also we appointed a manager to look at the uh, social care side of things as well. Um, from day one, I suppose, as well, um, we wanted this to be a very comfortable uh, place to stay, even though they were for short stays. 
Um, it, it was felt, I, I, I previously worked myself on the Fatima Mansions project and I knew the importance of the social care side of when you do anything to do with housing, I suppose. So um, uh, we, 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 from day one, we decided we wanted beds and we wanted really, really good facilities, even though they were for short stays. People are distressed. They're obviously having to leave their home in a rush. Uh, and we wanted to, I suppose, not add to their stress. Um, we were conscious we were offered camp beds and things like that, but we thought, no, do you know what, if we put in real beds, put in facilities for kids, uh, it, it might make the stay a little bit nicer and, uh, I suppose, alleviate some of the burden. The uh, document there on the right is actually one of the documents referred to earlier. Our community team and Southside Partnership worked on that, and it was a brilliant document translated into Russian and Ukrainian. And it gave uh, a list of all of the various services and uh, key contacts and thing, things to do in the local area as well. So uh, all of our guests would have got that. And we had that ready uh, before our, our, our first uh, uh, refugees arrived in the centre. Um, again, just to give a sense of facilities, a lot, a, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the refugees are arriving with, uh, some arrive with nothing, to be honest with you. Some, 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 ca some are coming with suitcases, but we've had an awful lot of people arrive at the centre with just the clothes on their back. Uh, so having washing facilities is really, really key. Uh, we actually have two, two areas where we can do laundry. Um, actually, uniquely in Ukraine, they don't seem to use tumble dryers, so we've actually had to train them how to use tumble dryers uh, so um, but they, they are used all day every day uh, we've gone through quite a few washing machines at this point but uh, again as I said when you when you when you don't have a lot of clothes uh, we need to have the facilities there for people uh, and you can see the photo on the right there is the reception area um, we, we staff at 24 hours a day as I said uh, we decided uh, early on that um, we wanted we wanted staff in the center who um, had a background in uh, social care or health care because we were dealing with such vulnerable people. Uh, so we, 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 got, uh, we managed to get staff through uh, a, an agency, a health care agency, and uh, they're all Garda vetted. They've all worked in uh, nursing home settings or social care settings. So uh, they've, been, they've been a great addition to the team up there and um, they do a great job up there as well. So, um, sorry. Yeah, uh, we got it again just to soften the look because it was a, it was a, as, as you could see by the earlier pictures, it was a warehouse, uh, where, warehouse setting. So we got an artist in to do a bit of art around the place. Um, we um, uh, put in basketball nets. We put in, uh, we drew, drew out the pavement for hopscotch and things like that. Um, we set up a. Uh, computer room there for uh, teenagers, sort of a teenage space with video games, uh, Apple computers, uh, they've chess, uh, they've other board games. We set up a, a space for younger children with age appropriate toys. Uh, we've, the amount of bikes we've gone through, uh, we've a couple of very generous local bike shops, plus a lot of people living locally who con continue to donate bikes to us. So uh, we, we have allowed actually a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the kids get attached to a particular bike. So when they do leave, we, we've sort of allowed them to take it away, but we've a continue, uh, continuous stream of bikes coming through. And it's actually wonderful because when you, when you come up on site, um, despite being a refugee center and the, the sad stories and all, 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 all of that, when you actually come up on site in Ballyogan, the first thing you're hit with is uh, a load of kids cycling bikes or on scooters. They nearly knock you over uh, and smiling and playing basketball, a lot of the parents be playing basketball with the kids. So um, I suppose this, despite the tragedy, um, uh, we're trying to make it as uh, happy a place as you can under the, under the circumstances. In terms of classes, Neve mentioned classes, like we, we, we regularly have dance, yoga, uh, tai chi, uh, all, all, all of those various classes. Uh, English classes, obviously. Uh, we do try where possible to get as many of them off site. Uh, we, we did, in, 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 the, in the beginning, I suppose, we did a lot of classes on site. But we felt then that a lot of, particularly in the early days, a lot of refugees weren't leaving the site. Uh, so we decided we have a, a leisure centre not too far away, up in uh, Samuel Beckett, up on the Ballyogan Road. So we started to do a lot of classes up there, which was great for getting people off site. And they, they then started to explore the area a little bit more. So, um, and again, our community team were uh, fantastic in sort of leading on that and our sports team. That, that, that's just some of the games. Um, in the kids' rooms, they're mad about chess. Uh, obviously, the, the, ta the sort of uh, younger kids' room as well. We've lots of li little games, teddies, uh, things like that, and uh, 
it's 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 a nice space for them, a, a bit of an escape, I suppose, from uh, the 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 harsh reality that they're in. Um, uh, I suppose just to sort of sum up, uh, in terms of best practice, we had to set this up in. Well, I said three weeks. It actually took us four. We were a week late, but. Um, we had to set this up so quickly that a lot of our best practice we've had to sort of do after the fact. Um, so I suppose since then, to, to run a centre of that size, you need policies, you need uh, procedures for staff, for the guests. So we, we, we've implemented several uh, policies and procedures, which we've also translated into Russian and Ukrainian for our guests. And stuff like, um, well, I suppose it's a given, we guard about everyone who works on site health and safety risk assessments, but we have a safeguarding policy, children first training for all our staff, code of conduct for staff, a complaints policy, we have house rules for drugs, alcohol and antisocial behaviour, uh, clear job descriptions for everyone. Like, to be fair, I suppose when we started, I had to get people in to the centre and I didn't necessarily have a job description for them, so we sort of had to make it up af uh, afterwards and, and, and tease it out. Um, in terms of best practice, how, how these things work well, multi-agency approach, um, you know, clear communication between all agencies. We have our community response forum, uh, which uh, the chief executive chairs. We were meeting every week. It's two. It's bi-weekly now, but there's been great engagement from everyone uh, on that. And uh, as I said, it, it's it's worked really well to date. Um, doing as many activities outside the centre as possible. We've done lots of trips to Airfield, we've done trips to the zoo, the circus, uh, trips to Crow, Crow Park, we managed to get some tickets for Garrett Brooks, things like that. We've, we, we've done our best to try and get as many sort of activities for people as possible, uh, particularly, uh, I suppose, for families, people with young children, you know. Um, we're still evolving, um, and, and that's one of the keys. I think, Neve, you mentioned it as well. Uh, when you're dealing with so many people and uh, there, there's definitely um, a difference between the people who are coming now versus the people who came a number of months ago so you do have to evolve we're still evolving up there we've had to build COVID rooms I in the interim we've had to um, we're looking now actually at building a homework club for children um, and uh, we're looking at building a workspace for adults and uh, we've managed to get Microsoft uh, who've been very generous uh, throughout the last few months to um, Put to, they're putting together a training course for uh, some of our guests as well, with a view to trying to get them into the jobs market. So, um, uh, there's, yeah, as I said, we're still evolving. We're not without our problems. I think every refugee centre, there, there, there are issues. Uh, but I suppose once you have your key policies and procedures and your, your, your community response form with everyone working together, there's sort of no problem that we kind of can't uh, uh, deliver on or, or, or address as such. Um, I suppose to date, uh, just to wrap up, yeah, we've had over 2,100 people stay with us in Ballyogan, uh, which is, is brilliant. Uh, we've had one birth on site, um, lots of birthday parties, things like that. We've had an awful lot of our guests, despite the fact that you have 60 people sharing a room together, we've had an awful lot of the people who stay with us who have not wanted to leave, you know, and uh, it's because of that, um, I suppose, that sa sense of safety and security and uh, despite the fact that they're all sharing rooms, we have a really nice setup uh, in terms of, as I said, play spaces for children, uh, activities for children, reading rooms for adults, and uh, all, all of the various other facilities. And just finally, sorry, yeah, the, the uh, Irish Refugee Council and the UN Refugee Agency have uh, called out, they've been regular visitors actually to, to, to the rest centre in Ballyogan, and they have uh, cited us as be best practice around Europe. So, which is a, you know, a testament to the wider team in, in DLR and uh, everyone who works up in the centre. So, uh, listen, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Neve uh, and uh, Aidan. Um, I think, you know, when it was a, a fitting um, example, I think, to finish our session on today. Um, I think it shows, and it's interesting, I think, looking back to what Stephen was talking to us about, and he showed us the 1,200-odd services that the, uh, the local authorities are responsible for providing. And before February, March this year, this wasn't one of them. Um, so I think it just goes to show exactly the role that local government plays on behalf of the state. Uh, I think, you know, anyone that's been involved in this in the local government sector can be justifiably proud 
of the work that they've done uh, in the last six or seven months. It's been an incredible response and has made such a difference to people's lives. So, uh, so well done to well done to all the staff. I know there's people watching in and people here who would have been involved as well. So this is real public service, I think, and great innovation too, um, which is what what we're talking about today. So look, um, that's the end of our, our presentations from today. So we've got our all of our presenters from the second session here now. So um, very happy to take some some questions from the floor. And I know we probably have some questions um, on, online as well, I'm sure. So any questions here in the room first for any of our presenters? Yeah, have one here. And thanks to all the presenters. It's just one question for Brian in relation to the project in Tipperary. You mentioned that one developer had done a deal with Lidl and they're developing on site. The machinery and business, how did you get them to move out? Did you have to provide some sort of incentive or did they have a, an alternative plan themselves? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. They were looking to, they were a family business that had been there for generations they were conscious of the fact that they couldn't stay where they were uh, and they were looking to expand because they were doing really well. So it was a coming together of minds of, listen, you have to move, let's work together, planning with them uh, where they should go. And that took time to identify the right site and then making, encourage them to make the site available to us. So even in making the application, rather than agree a price, we agreed a price per acre, because we didn't know how much we needed. So we agreed a rough price so we could make the application. They're happy to stand over it. They would probably get a lot more now, but as I mentioned in my presentation, they're invested in the town, and they want to see the town thrive, and they know that they couldn't stay where they were. Um, so yeah, they, they, they were very generous. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Any other questions in the room? Right. Eddie, do we probably have some questions from our yeah. online? <coughs> Thanks, thanks, Fiona. Just uh, um, for the bill to share, um, first of all, to say a lot of positive commentary again online about all the presentations, folks, so, so thanks for that and well done. Uh, Stephen, on the bill to share, a question as to what's the challenge, is it, what's the, what's the biggest challenge that programme is going to face in, in, in building it out? Yeah, I mean, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I, like I, I mentioned a few of them, I think that's... Um, it's clear because the, the most successful one so far has been the, the blended working application because there was a pressing deadline for it, even though the other applications which have been developed by a number of local authorities are very attractive and you know, do a great job. So I think that one of the challenges is going to be having the resources in the local authorities themselves to help implement them. Um, th lots of them are relatively simple to implement, except for the document management one, that's a big beast, I admit it, admittedly. There. But you do need um, the users to have the time to be able to commit to it, to onboarding it and training it, and to change their work practices. And you do need IT people in the local authorities to be able to lead on the projects as well. Um, so th I think that and the whole PR, getting the message out there, getting new applications in, get, or getting new things in from other local authorities as well, um, so that there's more and more to offer. Um, that's it. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, one in for Neve uh, and the Ukrainian project. What does the, 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 the negative publicity, uh, similar to what happened last weekend, how does that impact, if you like, the spirit and the morale uh, across the, the sector? Because, you know, there's some fantastic work happening, obviously, out there. Yeah, I, I think that it's having a negative effect, and I see a few of uh, the leads from on, from the local authority. I think it's having a negative impact. Um, but local authorities are hugely resilient, but it is having a very negative impact. And then, yeah, lastly then for Mary and for Lawrence, I suppose, what was the main challenge in the delivery of the project to date? Um, project, well, it's gone really well so far. I suppose bringing so many agencies together um, from different backgrounds who are delivering different services in the county, um, that was probably challenging at the start, but we recognise it was essential to set up that cross-agency steering grouping, you know, get input um, from people in different sectors um, throughout the county. But it's come together really well and people have worked really well together. So we're kind of delighted with how things have progressed. I think that's it, Fiona, now we're, we're running tight on time, so we may yeah. cap it at that. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, folks, and thanks for the questions. So that's the end of our presentations uh, from today, and thanks everybody for their engagement. Uh, hugely uh, positive and, and motivating, I think, to see the, the range of projects that's underway. Mm -hmm.